Sure. If Michael may or may not come, but we have a quorum already, right? Right. We have right. a full agenda. Right. Let's begin. Let's start with the introductions real quick. Shane Adma, uh, Milwaukee City Council. Luca Parks, Milwaukee City Councilor. John Stahl, Citizen Chair of the Budget Committee. Mark Amba, Mayor. Milo Denham, Citizen Member. Angel Falconer, City Councilor. Bonnie Dennis, Finance Director. And Michael Osborne. And Judy Serio, Accountant. Sorry, I'm late. Mike Osborne, Citizen Member. All right. So, uh... We do have an item here, a uh, discussion item, agenda item for council co compensation. We have some <laughs> people here from the public who want to make comments, so, or I believe want to make comments. So we'll allow you to, to do that when that comes up. The first order of business is the approval of our uh, August 20th, 2018 committee meeting. Minutes. Move to approve the minutes. We'll set again. Moved and seconded to approve the minutes. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, February meeting. So um, the February 8th meeting was actually held um, on a holiday meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we wanted to switch that um, in general, and we were hoping for February 11th um, so that we can get that in connection with the CUAB board as well. Um, John may have more to this, but we had a meeting with uh, the chair for CUAB um, and having a, a joint meeting to kind of clarify um, budget P policy, policy matters. matters. Yeah, um, I probably would be very useful. So. Um, we were hoping to switch that to February 11th and get that on board. So you're saying move it to February 11th from whatever the current yes. schedule, which I don't know what it is, but... Yeah. We had set, during the budget committee uh, meetings, during the budget hearings, we had set all the meetings out for the year, and that one we set for a holiday. So okay. we're hoping to get that changed. No, it was originally on... Um, President's Day, the 18th of February. <clears throat> right. Okay. So right. to move it to the to the 11th. Yes. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, <clears throat> compensation. Is, is someone going to go through this or? Yeah, actually, Gary Rebello, our oh, okay. director. He's going to step in here. And as, er, uh, as Gary's coming up, this is Ann. I just wanted to let everyone know that originally we had asked for the League of Oregon Cities to do this portion of the work for tonight. They were unable to complete their broader study, and so Gary went out and did a comparison to our uh, 10 cities that we do a market analysis against for our, our pay for staff. Yeah, the League of Working Cities last did elected official stipends benefits back in April of 2006. So I took their kind of questions and formats, collected similar, almost identical data for the, for the most part, um, but restricted that to, and turned that into a survey monkey that we sent out to the 10 cities that Ann referenced. So the 10 cities here aren't really arbitrary. They're the 10 cities that we use for collective bargaining, reference for uh, compensation, for benefits. Uh, this is what we consider to be our market, so to speak. Um, so uh, these are the 10 cities I use for this study. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so on the left-hand side, I think you all have this gigantic spreadsheet, and you can see the 10 cities um, with, uh, uh, so if you see can be, seven is the number of, uh, the size of their city council, so uh, most are seven, a few are five, and the city population. And so what we ask them, what's in that box is basically the stipend, the cash compensation element of, of pay. So what we looked at was monthly, uh, what's the stipend, do you pay a stipend basically? And if you pay a stipend, what do you pay the mayor or the counselor? How frequently, how frequently do you adjust the stipend and what would the basis be for making that adjustment? 
So if you just start with can be, they said yes, they have a stipend, they pay the mayor $200 a month, council, councilors $100 a month, uh, infrequent, infrequent means it could go years before they adjust it and there's no real numeric, no basis for it other than council action. Uh, if you go down to Lake Oswego, yes, 415-185, they do it annually and they adjust it based on the CPI index on an annual basis. So most, some cities, it's just very infrequent based on council action and then there's, uh, I think, about three cities that do it on a CPI index. Um, if you see an <clears throat> NA for Gladstone, Oregon City, and Sherwood, they don't pay the mayor counselor. That's strictly a voluntary position with no stipend. Um, so I've list, listed uh, the mayor stipend where there is a stipend and a stipend for counsel and frequency adjusted and change basis. Uh, for Milwaukee, yes, we pay a stipend. It's $300 for the mayor, $250 for counselors. It's infrequent council action. I'm not even sure the last time we've changed it, but I'm, I'm sure it's been a while. Any questions on that piece? Okay, then we went into, okay, what are the other types of, I don't know, perks, so to speak. Um, and we asked, gosh, do you provide a cell phone or tablet? Uh, Canby does, uh, Tualatin does, and Wilsonville does. The other cities don't. We do. We provide a Surface tablet. Uh, nobody provides PERS. Um, one, two, three, four cities provide workers' compensation insurance, which we do through our... Uh, uh, volunteer through our safe workers comp insurance program we do cover council um, do you issue a city credit card uh, two of the cities said yes and we do that as well uh, pretty much everybody covers memberships except for two cities and we do as well uh, everybody has some money that they send council to training and conferences as as we do um, three cities provide health insurance um, uh, Forest Grove, um, uh, Mayor and Council, they provide um, health insurance up through family. Um, Tualatin does for Council for uh, health insurance for the elected only. Mayor can uh, cover family. And uh, Wilsonville is Mayor and Council up to family. And if you see Tualatin, if you go back to the far left, their stipend is the insurance. And if you don't want the insurance, they'll give you the opt-out of $100. And that's, CI, that's insurance through CIS, City and County Insurance. And they currently have a $100 opt-out. So, and, uh, so that's what they offer. Um, some of the cities provided uh, an expense budget. That's an annual expense budget. Some are, I've noted where it's a biannual, but I, by, under that column I reported the annual amount. Um, we do 9,500, it's a biennial, 19,000 a year, and that covers those things over there like trainings, conferences, memberships. Um, and you can see it kind of varies. Um, you have a bit of an outlier with West Lynn at 30,000, the rest are about 5,000 to 10,000. And the others uh, did not report. I think that's Tualatin at 30,000, isn't it? Uh, is it Tualatin? Yeah, sorry, I probably should put some. Yeah, I am just. Chart. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Westland's more like ours. What about uh, covering mileage? Uh, that would be in the uh, expense budget, I believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. As far as air travel, meals, all that stuff would be covered under that. Okay. That is correct, and that is how we manage the budget here at the city. So the expense budget is in addition to the monthly amount that some counselors and the mayor receive. The expense budget is completely separate, right? From the stipend? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a separate line item for general yep. expenses. Is that the uh, where we each get 3000 a year or something, some sort of uh, fixed amount? Yes. Yes, it is. And then if it's not used, it's just returned to the, it carries over yes. or mm -hmm. re, re put back in the fund yeah. and not carries over, but yeah. mm -hmm. it's not used. Well, do we have job descriptions for the mayor and the counselors? Uh, I don't do those. Um, I don't know. It's might be something in the charter. The, the charter has a very simplistic two sentence, two sentences kind of thing. Do any of the other cities have job descriptions? I did not ask them. 
because it's kind of hard to measure between these when you don't know what's expected from the mayor and the councillors at the other cities versus what we expect from ours. Yeah. Well, Anne might know what's in our charter offhand. I've read it. I have a good idea, but I don't know. If we don't need it now, but I'd yeah. like to see one. So the charter, it really is up to the council uh, and the mayor how positions are managed um, because every council is different. So we could create something, but the next council may want a different role or a different relationship between them. Uh, the charter does outline what is required of the council, the city manager, and uh, the attorney, I believe, and judge. Here's so another question I had, Gary, on the on the health insurance. For example, you said Tualatin offers either health insurance or you get a hundred. Well, one or the other. What we do is CIS insurance is so we have CIS insurance for our employees, uh -huh. uh, and if they opt out and they have proof of other coverage, um, they can get up to a hundred dollars. We don't do a hundred dollars; we do fifty dollars. Okay. Uh, the max they'll allow, on a, and that I I do that through that's a bargained amount. Okay. Um, so we could do up to 100. We, we did less than 50. We bargained it up to 50 this last go around. Uh, but they offer up to 100. And so they're just offering the employee opt out that CIS provides. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So they do provide. I see some of these that provide health insurance. Are you saying that the, if health insurance is provided, it's through CIS or just for Tualatin? Uh, for tw uh, so Forest Grove, you would get the you'd get the two hundred or hundred dollar stipend uh, plus the plus the insurance. But would the health insurance be through CIS, or I just believe depends? All of them be through CIS. I didn't ask that specifically, but I uh, I know they do that for their employees, so I'm assuming that's what they use for council. And do you have any idea? You have listed here no pers for all of them, and so or do they? Describe the mayor or the counselor as an employee, those who provide insurance? I'd have to ask them. I, my guess is no. Uh, it's an elected position. Um, um, I, I, I don't see it as an employee relationship, but other cities may see it differently. Okay. And do you have any idea what a monthly cost is for health insurance? Um, it depends if what plan they're picking. Um, well, it's ballpark, like yeah, ballpark. Four, five hundred bucks. Or? Um, yeah, way north of that. Uh, it's a, for a family. You're probably wow. talking eighteen hundred dollars a month for an individual, just one employee, no dependents. Probably in the six to eight hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Ballpark. Just, yeah. that's about right, isn't it? Yeah, that sounds yeah. about right. Thanks. That also makes me wonder if, on the insurance, if, I mean, hypothetically, let's say that um, someone has their own insurance or they're on Medicare or, or yeah, Medicare, whatever, you know, and that um, if that means that the city just pays that instead of like something that's a $1,800 premium. <coughs> Or reimburses like yeah, well, you know, for, Medicare, which would be a couple of hundred dollars. Yeah, uh, for Tualatin, if you had your own insurance, if you're on Medicare, you could just take the hundred bucks. Yeah, but that's the only one that mentions uh, either or. Right. Yeah. I, the other ones do the stipend and they do the insurance. You could always not take the insurance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they would give you the, the opt out or not. No, it's, right. But it's like, what kind of insurance are they paying for? We don't know that. Right now. So if it's CIS, it's uh, medical, dental, it's uh, either Kaiser or uh, Blue Cross Regions, yeah. Regions Blue Cross. Those are the two plans they offer. But they offer different levels of those plans. Yeah. Uh, so there's like, a, you know, an ABC kind of a thing. So there's, we yeah. offer our employees the most expensive plan. Yeah. So I think it would be interesting to know how much they pay for the insurance because if it's like in the 16 to 1800 dollars a month that changes the skew of yeah and like i say it's just those three just three cities yeah good thank you 
Would anyone here like to say anything from the public? Yeah, I'm curious, like, how much does this, I have no idea what, like, the operating budget is for the city. I run a budget. We need them to come up. They won't be able to be heard. We're on the air, so you probably have to come up to Oh, great. Okay. Do you want me to stay? I don't know. Uh, I think you're done. (laughs) Good job, Gary. (laughs) Okay. My name is Craig Ernst. I'm a homeowner here. Um right near Rao Junior High School, and I've been a homeowner since 2004 in Milwaukee. So I'm very familiar with finances, and um, I am curious, like, um, you know, let's say without this health insurance or if it was just $500 a month or something, how much money are we talking about in compensation for the mayor and and uh, the counts- and the counselors, and what is the budget impact? I mean, is this something that we're discussing because it's a ma- you know, it's a matter of... <clears throat> process or is this something that really is going to impact like some other projects or other things that the city is wanting to do or fund and I would it's kind of a rhetorical question because if it's coming out of some general funding that's there and we can compensate folks for doing good work then I absolutely stand by it but if it comes at the cost of some other programs that we're trying to do or that that's really important to the citizens around here then um, perhaps more discussion or more looking into it. So, yeah, that's, I guess, about it. Okay. All right. Does it significantly impact the budget to do this, or is I that... I guess Bonnie's probably in the best position to answer that, but I would say the overall compensation, just based on the monthly stipends, is very small relative to the overall size of the budget. You're talking about maybe twelve or $13,000 relative to a forty or $50 million budget. So, no, it's not very large. It's current. It, it would Currently. require some more additional Currently. research on that, though, to see what the, the impacts of that is also long term. Um, but the city council budget right now is fairly tight in general. Um, but we definitely would need to do more analysis to, to look into it. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'll fill this out and okay, thank you. hand it in. <coughs> All right. Uh, well, Vince Alvarez next. <clears throat> Hello, Vince Alvarez here in Milwaukee. Um, yes, I've been thinking about this for a while uh, since this was brought up several months back, where some people were talking about this situation. And I know that a lot of the I know a lot of the counselors, I know the mayor very well, and I know they spend a great deal of time doing activities, uh, not just the meetings here in Milwaukee, but also in the meetings with the county and whatnot that they have to travel to and, and spend time on. And I'm not exactly sure. I think it needs studying. I, I think we need to compensate them more so than we are now. It needs studying exactly how we go about doing that. Whether it's a mix of insurance, some sort of pay, maybe an hourly rate. Because I know also in the past some mayors and some counselors have spent less time doing uh, activities like with the county or with the city or with TriMet, um, Metro, than, than some do now. So I don't know if you can just sit there and say a flat rate for, you know, a flat rate a month or a flat rate a week or whatever, but maybe it's some type of keeping track of hours and compensating them on that basis. I just think that we don't want just a bunch of old, retired white guys on our council. <laughs> and uh, we don't have that now. We don't but, have. <laughs> yeah. And we're not going to have. We're not going to have that, but we have it in the past. And you yeah. see some other councils and some other uh, governmental organizations in the state that that kind of what you get. You get older people who are set, who are financially set, who can afford to spend the time to do this. And if we want to increase diversity and want to increase a cross-section of the population, then we then we do need to give it give them some sort of reason other than the, to serve, you know, to volunteer to serve. I volunteer. I'm an NDA and I'm a chair of that. I'm a chair of the uh, utility board. Don't get any compensation. Don't expect to. But that's a minimal amount of time in comparison to what the counselors and the mayor does. does. So yes, I, I think it needs to be studied. I think we need to figure out some some increase above the the stipend, <laughs> the, the pittance that you guys get now. So yeah, that's my two cents worth. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, ben Rousseau. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, including this topic on tonight's uh, 
tonight's agenda and for uh, I, I saw my email that it went around got included in the packet as a kind of a last minute addition to uh, for you guys to prepare for but uh, hopefully um, some of that uh, came across and made some sense um, I guess my main points Vince hit on a lot of them but um, I guess uh, um, I've, I've been here in, in Milwaukee for is it seven eight years now and um, since I've been here, I've seen a ramp up in participation and uh, and involvement in community pr uh, projects and and, and uh, efforts elsewhere by the uh, mayor and council, and it's greatly appreciated. Uh, I think we have a lot of outside influences that are affecting our city right now and are going to continue to um, things like the huge uh, population growth in the metro area. Um, the uh, affordability of housing, um, issues related to climate change, uh, and, and uh, smoke and, and, and floods and things like that that we've been uh, impacted by that seem like they uh, are going to just continue to take a lot more attention and we're going to require some great um, strategy and direction um, to, to address. Um, I realize that we have a city manager and, and administration, uh, an administrative body to take care of a lot of those things, but a lot of these things that are coming at us are new and they require uh, a lot of uh, um, strategic kind of planning and involvement in a deeper way that I believe that only a council and mayor can, uh, can provide. So um, basically, the, my, my main points are uh, I don't want us to go back to uh, a part-time mayor and council kind of situation where the, it's just a small percentage of their monthly monthly focus and they're not actually actively taking on the, the issues that we need to address. Um, that's my biggest concern that we're going to end up in a situation where uh, eventually we'll go back to that and we have a lot of things that we need to deal with here as a city. Um, in addition to that, I, I think it was only respectful to compensate these uh, people who were voted in by the public uh, to, to serve and uh, compensate them for their efforts here on the council. Um, and then the other point is what Vince brought up is uh, I think beginning to pay uh, for this position and, and offer um, health insurance as well that provides, it opens up, makes it that that much more inclusive for people who are really not able to um, get involved at this point. I've heard that from conversations with many people here in Milwaukee who have, in, have had interest in getting more involved, but when they realize what the compensation was, it's like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. I have a family to support, right? So uh, I think that, uh, those are my main points. I think it's something that I, I would really appreciate the um, committee to evaluate in a, a deeper way. And I, and I appreciate the question of uh, what are the job descriptions? If it's a two-line job description, we probably need to maybe uh, rewrite that because I don't think we want to continue with, uh, with a mayor or council that only has two lines of uh, commitment to the city, right? We, we want a deeper commitment going forward. Can we ask questions? Yeah. So would you want this to go before the voters or would you expect council to take action on its own or an independent compensation <clears throat> committee? You know, I'm not familiar with the budget committee and how the uh, process is done here. Um, this is something I believe uh, needs to <clears throat> happen one way or another. Um, so uh, I, I guess I would leave that up to you in terms of how what the best way is to approach that. Um, if it can be achieved through standard process uh, within the committee and council, I think that that would be um, justifiable. Okay. And do you see the mayor's position as a full-time job? I can't imagine it not being a full-time job. Yeah. So when you, if you were ballparking in your mind what you think the mayor should be paid, what would it be? I mean, ideally it would be a, um, a, a, a living wage or a family wage that actually could su support a family, right? If it's a full-time job, you'd want a full-time effort put into it that would uh, provide for that. What I uh, had asked for or put out in the, that email um, was $15 an hour to at least be paid at the same rate as uh, the lowest paid city employee. That's, uh, 
I think a good starting point at least. Okay. And what about the counselors? Counselors, uh, you know, I really don't know uh, the level of uh, effort that counselors put in in terms of, uh, you know, is, if the, is that a full-time job? You could answer that uh, better than I could. Uh, I imagine it, on some months it can some be. Some weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I've, 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 seen, I've been in here at council meetings with a 1,000-page-plus uh, packet uh, that you guys have gone through and, and dog-eared and whatnot. Okay, thanks. So. So do you have an idea of what you expect from the mayor? What do I expect from the mayor? You personally, yes. Me personally? Yeah. Uh, I expect a high level of engagement with all, all uh, committees. Uh, I expect an uh, a, um, involvement with other uh, cities around the region and uh, metro government so that we have a clear um, connection and direction from what the expectations are and the um, direction from other cities in the region. Um, and yeah, high level involvement in community um, projects and efforts as well. If that makes sense, events and whatnot. And do you have one for the counselor? A counselor? Um, you know, uh, from what I have seen and I have grown to expect mm -hmm. is a level of engagement on the different committees that I've served on. Uh, and, uh, and it's not just like a superficial engagement. It's, it's been, you know, have, you know, deeply involved with uh, process and whatnot. Um, but also really thoughtful review of the decisions that need to be made. Um, at the um, periodic meetings, the, that review of those packets and making sure that they understand the, the needs of the citizens and, and um, yeah, in, a, in a, um, a deep way, I guess. Is that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So <clears throat> another follow-up question. When we look at this list here, and I know it's just a few cities and selective, and this is how we uh, compare mm -hmm. ourselves from an employment standpoint, but if you look just at this list alone, Milwaukee's right there with everyone else. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what I hear you saying, maybe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, is that fundamentally Oregon cities are doing it wrong, or is Milwaukee an outlier? I would think that Oregon cities are doing it wrong, probably. You know, I don't know the pressures that are on every city out there, but I, I would imagine they're very similar. And... Um, I, uh, yeah, I think we need to take, start taking a different approach to that. I can't imagine. I, I, I think there's so many needs that our city and other cities have that the state and federal governments are just not going to address. So we need to have that um, appropriate guidance and direction at the municipal level, and we need to compensate for it. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? All right, Ben, thank you for your insight. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. Uh, Rice. All right. Interesting Q&A we have going the opposite direction for once. Um, so, hello, Bryce Magorian. Um, much like Ben, I've also served on the Comprehensive Planning Action Committee and the Vision Action Committee. And I was very pleased when I first decided to become engaged in local government to find that there was an active and engaged mayor and city council. I came to learn more about the municipal structures over the last few years than perhaps I even wanted to but it's been fantastic and I can't um, echo enough what Vince was saying and what Ben were, was saying about the need for um, to professionalize this to to bump it up to have people in these positions that are that have the compensation and feel like they can spend the time being engaged being active that this doesn't revert to just being sort of almost a a hobby or a level of, of just minimal volunteer commitment. Um, I think I in particular want to echo Ben. Um, you asked, you know, do you think Oregon City's got it wrong? Absolutely, I do. Um, I feel like it was born perhaps out of a out of a good place. I know, as as Ben mentioned, we do have city manager, we have a professional staff, and I was part of that email chain that Ben sent out. And um, the way Councillor Beatty put it is is sort of that the council is essentially a 
the board of directors to the staff of the city. Um, speaking as a member of a nonprofit organization, I know kind of how that works. Um, but uh, that also, as a member of a nonprofit organization, most of the time, at most of the organizations I've been at, the board is incredibly disengaged. Um, and I don't think that's the kind of relationship we want to have with our elected officials um, in a city. And so, whether that, you know, speaking as, you know, uh, taxpayer of one, uh, whether that needs to be, you had asked, does it need to go to the voters? Does it need to be um, something? I would be more than happy to pay more in taxes to see that, you know, the council and mayor are adequately compensated for the fantastic and, you know, dogged work they do. Whether that be just, you know, on a local level or advocating for us in Salem or at Metro or what have you. Are you saying that you think it should go before the voters? You personally will vote for it, but I would. Yes, I would personally vote and campaign for it. But um, that is, I think, probably the the, sh the surest way to get a lot lasting change in this regard. I don't know if it's the best way or if you know. I, I can just I can just hear it now. If council acted alone, everybody would suddenly be up in arms about it, and mm -hmm. you know, and, oh no, we don't want to. You know, they wouldn't even know necessarily what it was about. They would just hear that more they, money, more, more money, exactly. So I feel like it would be. At, I mean, again, I have not done in-depth study on this, but I feel like that would be one way, and certainly I would, I would help in whatever way I could. Thank you. So we don't have any attorneys here, but I'm not really sure. Can we raise property taxes and say, you know, no. a, a dime or something no. like that? We can't. we can't do that. Okay. <clears throat> Pretty sure we could. I think Thank you, Bryce. The manager's still on the phone. Now, our, our, the, the property tax is, is fixed. Measures 5 and 50 basically locked property taxes uh, that the cities had at the level that they were in 1992, I believe, uh, plus 3% a year on the years that the property values go up more than 3% a year. Um, but beyond that, a city can't just decide to, to raise its its property taxes. It can't. We can't even... Uh, as a council decide to enact a gas tax, for example, anymore. That has to go to a vote of the people. So it's, it's very limited what we can, uh, the tax structure that we are allowed to change anymore. Right, and the reason that property tax, taxes change so much every year is because of bonds and levies, not because some jurisdiction decided just to raise property tax. It's bonds and levies on top of that right, right, right. assessed value, the AV, that's already in place. Well, I've got, I've got two more here, and then we'll kind of open it up for discussion, I guess. Uh, Kathy Heise. Hello, everyone. Um, Understandably, uh, I'm Kathy Heisey, by the way. I live in Island Station. Um, and I'm also a counselor elect, full disclosure. I am not here to speak to the issue of compensation for counselors. That is an awkward position to be in. Um, but I would like to speak to specifically the mayoral position. Um, I did a little bit of reading around about this topic, and I have some thoughts. Um, it's really complex. How we do it matters if we're going to talk about increasing compensation for the mayor. How we do it needs to be done carefully. I think we need to appoint an independent commission to have that conversation and to fully flesh it out so that we can give the voters an honest assessment of what it would look like. Um, wages versus stipends make a difference in terms of PERS, in terms of compensation packages, and so forth. So I just want to name that it's a very complex thing. I also want to echo what others have stated about uh, there's an equity issue balanced or buried in all of this in that the people who can afford to be the mayor are the people who can afford to pay for being the mayor. And that's just something that that may be the way it has to be. But I think we do need to be honest about the fact that the way it's structured right now affects who can lead in our community. Um, there's an interesting example um, when thinking about, about what a mayor is and what a mayor does. Right now, our charter doesn't say a whole lot. 
It's very, very basic. Essentially, if the mayor shows up and convenes city council meetings, we're good. Um, it's a little broader than that, but it's a very simple job description. When I was reading on this, there's an example in the city of Tigard, which is roughly double the population of Milwaukee. So it didn't show up on that page, didn't show up in the assessment. Um, they have a stipend for their mayor. Their stipend is around, it's in the 40K range, at least it was in 2016 in the article I was reading. And the article was about how they had determined that it was time to bump the stipend for the mayor up. And a lot of the commentary in this article was very specific to what they expected the mayor to do. And it was very much about the mayor is showing up, being the same face, meeting after meeting, representing the community at the table when negotiating for things that benefit the community, representing the community in Salem, um, essentially lobbying and outreach work that is a little different from what the city manager can really do. They have the same model of government that Milwaukee uses. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of latitude in how we think about what a stipend might be. I think if we're going to think about changing the stipend for the mayor, we might want to think about what the charter says about the job description. And we might also want to think about the fact that we have benefited for several years now from having a very active mayor. And we've seen how that has benefited the community. It's brought in dollars, it's brought in reputation. It has built from uh, a number of different quarters, strong leadership both on the council level and in the neighborhoods and in the committees. We have waiting lists for committees. Most cities don't have that experience. Um, so I don't know how you quantify that. That's not my job. <laughs> but I do think that there is an argument to be made for looking at the issue and appointing an independent commission that does that work. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Stephen Lash, Lasherbrook. It's actually, Stephen Lashbrook, 4342 Southeast Rockwood Street. Um, I'm in the unique position, I think, of uh, having worked for four of the cities on that list uh, through the years. And um, I agree with most of the things that have already been said to you this evening. Uh, so I guess I'm it just kind of uh, adding into that. I do think uh, there's merit in uh, treating the mayor's position differently than councilor's positions, even though the mayor is a member of the council. And as I've been told by city councilors who were not mayors in the past, he only has one vote. Um, but that uh, does not talk about what a good mayor does uh, mostly away from the city and the amount of time it takes to do that work. Um, and even on the list of those cities, I can tell you as somebody who was at many, many, many meetings at Metro and ODOT <laughs> and in Salem, League of Cities, uh, the list goes on and on, that some of those cities you never see their uh, elected officials participating. You see some staff participation and sometimes not even that. Um, and. The thing about that that strikes me as most important is that there's money at stake. And that's just the bottom line of it. Uh, there are times when if you don't have somebody in the room, someone playing an active part, someone raising their hand saying, our city would like to participate, that money doesn't come your way. And that's just the way it is. Um, I've seen it happen over and over. Um, another part of it that's, a, that's sort of similar and may come across as sounding crass, but to me, as somebody who worked in cities for 45 years, it doesn't seem crass at all, but there are deals to be made. There are the times when the mayor of one city needs to meet with the mayor of three other, mayors of three other cities and decide uh, who is going to support whose effort to get uh, sidewalk funding in the next round from ODOT or some other funding like that. It, um, sometimes it's block grant money. It could be a lot of different things. Um, again, if you're not participating, you're not part of the decision process and you can't affect the outcome. 
so all of that gets to having a mayor who has the ability and the willingness to carve out that kind of time and be there and play that active part. And Mayor Gamba has done it. I would say in fairness uh, that Mayor Knapp from Wilsonville is another one that's really an exception. And you see both those gentlemen at the same meetings, you know, over and over again, working on the same issues. Um, I, I guess a, another way to approach this is, and I realize this is an off-cycle time for budgeting uh, for you, but it's uh, to think in terms of moving this ball forward and maybe not accomplishing everything all at once, uh, but moving in that direction, and I certainly heard testimony that would support that. Um, <sighs> And, and tr again, treating the mayor's position differently with a higher expectation for the mayor. And yes, probably a, a better job description in the charter would, would be helpful. Um, I guess I'm kind of jumping around here, but things are popping into my mind from past history. I worked in one city where the mayor didn't even read his packets before city council meetings, much less show up at meetings. And when I asked him about it and uh, in the most diplomatic way I could think of. He said, well, that's what we hired you for. Um, but he missed the point entirely because there were certain conversations that I would not have been involved in, would not have been invited to be involved in, that he would have if he'd bothered to show up. Um, so I've kind of rambled here. What, oh, I guess the, I'd want to leave this with, uh, I, I'm a, a populist and a believer in, in true democracy, which this country, of course, is not, has not probably ever had and may have may not have for a couple hundred years but um, the idea of putting this to a vote the part of that that worries me is that it seems to me it may be incremental it may be something and for budget necessity something that you could increase uh, a slight bit a year or every two years in the budget process uh, and that is not the kind of thing you want to be going back to the voters for on a, on a every two year romance um, I think I'll leave it at that, and I'd be glad to answer any questions if I could. Would you support an independent uh, commission to determine compensation? Um, yeah, I, again, it's like, oh no, that's just one more thing that costs money, it takes time. Uh, but I, I think that, um, uh, I, I think it's the kind of thing that might tend to generate more support in the community, especially from people who have no idea what the mayor does, and they think that he's down here running City Hall on a daily basis and hiring and firing employees and all that. And it's very hard to, to explain that, no, there are other things the mayor needs to do. Someone else will take care of those things. Uh, anyway, that's a long answer to your question. I, I, I think that it probably is necessary and given that it's not really a prime budget cycle time, if you started that process soon, it, it could, could work towards, you know, uh, at least a mid biennium budget time look. All right. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Stephen. And thanks to all of you who showed up to give testimony. Well, certainly a lot to think about. I mean, there seems to be like a major gap between what we're paying and what you would expect a more professional mayor, even a living wage of $15 an hour, which is not a living wage. That's You're talking about a major increase. So I guess I would be leaning towards the independent commission and have them come up with some recommendation. I think, uh, as Stefan pointed out, we're early on in this biennium. If we get on it right away, maybe we'll have something by, you know, the supplemental budget for 2020 or something like that. Well, one thing I wanted to say is... Come right. up to the microphone. Okay. Is that um, Mayor Gamba's done an exceptional job, and I've been to some of the council meetings as well, and you all seem very engaged. And um, I run into Mayor Gamba and I've asked him before about his compensation and I was totally shocked because I assume the position of mayor is a full-time position um, but I'm hearing other things in the room which leads me to all the other elected official type situations where once you're elected 
you're really just waiting till the next election unless somebody actively takes you out. So you can do whatever you want. Mayor Gamba has stepped up to the plate and done an excellent job. We've reaped the benefits, and if we want that to continue, um, then it may be worth considering having a real livable wage. I wasn't even really considering that, is, is that the, the residents of Milwaukee have seen such a major change for the positive, and if we want to bring people that are of that caliber, then we really do need to consider that, because the other alternative is, like, this gentleman brought up where folks are just showing up when they need to or not even at all. I do view it um, after listening to the conversation and I work for a nonprofit as an executive director and a board of directors and I agree a board of directors can be pretty disengaged but a hundred or a couple hundred dollars a month doesn't necessarily change that either. But um, So I think it depends on where the value is and what we want to see in the future and whether or not we trust that other people are going to come in and take Mayor Gamba and the, this council's um, example over the years or if they're going to go in a different direction of laziness or, or non-committalness. So thank you. Thank you. I guess I had one further question. Is it, uh, legally, can, can the, the members of the public vote on a, a budget matter like this? I don't um, Certainly. The, uh, and maybe Ann can chime in a little bit, but there's a process involved, and I believe that um, the budget committee can recommend to city council that they would like to have a, a commission or a committee to be looking at the council compensation. Um, but I think as far as the voting piece of it is, it goes, I don't, I'd, I'd have to actually defer to Ann on that one. So we can refer uh, matters to the ballot. Um, I believe, and we can send out to the budget committee what that process looks like. There was a group that had come in during the budget meetings um, saying that they were interested in actually collecting signatures for the for some sort of referendum. We did not receive any sort of paperwork uh, creating that process. So I guess uh, just to clarify, uh, Chair Stoll, are you asking, could we actually refer this to the ballot, or are you asking whether or not staff has capacity to create the committee? I, I was wondering whether uh, the members of the public could actually vote on any kind of budget item. You know, say we wanted to do some inc incremental spending to support the mayor and counselors and have the people uh, vote could. on it. Yeah, they could vote on a matter that had been referred. So typically a referendum would be um, a question as to whether or not compensation should be uh, granted to the council. In Westland, the charter actually calls out the compensation. Uh, the way they drafted their language is somewhat broken. Uh, it's always dicey when you start getting into how you're going to increase um, on an annual or biennial basis that income. They had tied it to uh, the, the Portland index that's being discontinued. So theirs is somewhat uh, problematic right now. Uh, but we could, if, if that was the decision of this group, is to be about putting it on for a vote of the public, you could. The alternative is that we could have a special committee set up and they could go through a process that then made a recommendation straight either to the budget committee or to the council. And to clarify, when I was saying a vote of the people, I was assuming an advisory vote only. Is this a good idea? Uh, some cities have had to put it to a vote because it's in their charter and they were already restricted. For example, Bend and Salem and others. Uh, Bend had one recently where the charter <coughs> described what the mayor and counselors made. And so that had to go to a vote of the people to, to change it. Our charter just says that council will prescribe compensation for the counselors and the mayor. So I don't think we need, to, we need to go to a vote. My question was more, this is one of those things that is politically could be uh, something that you might want an advisory vote. Not, I don't think that you are required to go vote. Well, and then some of the correspondence that we received, I think that was noted, too, that council should consider that what it, what it would look like to the public if council just said, oh, yeah. On it, yeah, on its own without a commission. Yeah, um, without, yeah, without something in between. 
Because we had, in addition to the testimony here tonight, we also had what, two or three right, emails right. with various thoughts and opinions. And this is also right now, at Salem is considering the very same issue as of right now. I mean, there was just a motion filed recently. City at, of Salem. At City of Salem. They don't, I don't think they pay anything. Um, and then Bend had its, Bend's mo um, charter amendment passed in May. Mm -hmm. So they're they're setting on working and on what that compensation should be, and they've tied it to the uh, median area income, a percentage. I have a question and then a couple of comments. In our budget, we have 15.7 million in property taxes revenue for the biennium. Mm -hmm. Is that based on the property tax that we collected last year? Was that the basis for it? Is no, we assumed that it would go up with the three percent? Um, that's a complex comp uh, calculation that, that we do every year, for every biennium. So, so uh, does it include the any new income from new build? Mm, no, I th uh, I'd have to go back and double check them, how that's exactly calculated because <clears throat> I didn't actually personally work on that calculation. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe it's including <clears throat> inclusive of um, property tax values at the time of mm -hmm. the budget cycle. Okay. So not, um, I don't know if there's an assumption built in for new built or not. Because. Um... Hey, Bonnie. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify. I, I would like a little time with staff to confirm that. I do believe that the axle tree development was included in the calculation. So things where we had um, active applications and construction happening, I believe we actually did calculate, but we'd have to go back and look. So I sort of come at this from, I have high expectations for my city. I've been here only five and a half years, but I've become involved and I enjoy the city. I really appreciate it. I also have high expectations for the mayor and the councilors because without them, the city wouldn't work. I know we have the staff, but that's only part of it. We need direction from the board of directors. And when I discovered like two or three years ago what the compensation was, I thought it was abysmal. I was appalled because they do so much work. And if we, and it comes back to expectations, I expect high level performance from my mayor and counselors. And I typically see that. I can remember uh, watching a city council meeting one time when we had Councillor Power was on the council and she was going through a contract and talking about the issues of the contract. And I thought I've done that in my job and that's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time to do that type of work. And I think that the pay that we see here is based on a model from 30 plus years ago. And today, government is more complex. Interaction with business is more complex. So I think the need is to couple compensations with expectations and you have to start with a, either a job description or expectations. That's how you do a comp study. That's how you figure out what the pay should be instead of looking at what other people are doing because we don't know what these other people have to do or should do or are expected to do. And while I can't see us increasing property taxes as we commented earlier, I could see that we could set aside whatever we come up with for a cost and take it from the increase from new build because that's where we get increased income. And it's almost like found money if it's not in the budget here, if we didn't expect it. So I know in our neighborhood, we've got two new houses going in on 20th by Eagle and we have up to 31 going in on 19th. Probably won't be that many, I hope not. But it could be 31. That's what the uh, law calls for. And so from that, we're going to see new property tax come in to the city. And I like the idea of, since we have a budget, yes, it's the, we're out of tune with looking at a new budget, but we could look at some of this new income, new found income, and earmark most of it or all of it or a part of it for this process. And then that's how we could fund it over time and ramp it up to a point. So I like the commission idea because it gets it, you get involved with some, a counselor or two and pe 
people from uh, the city that are involved and some people who aren't. And I know within our uh, neighborhood, we have some people that think we ought to pay the mayor and we have some people think it should be uh, unpaid and that's the way it should be. They should be volunteering their time. So there's both sides of it, but let's kick it around and see where it goes. And I think that's how you do it is with a commission. All right. So anyone willing to put a motion out there for us? <laughs> Well, I would like to maybe comment on just the very last thing that you said, Milo. I think um, any committee, I, I'm supportive of, of if the direction that I think um, our citizen members of the budget committee are interested in pursuing um, an independent committee or task force, not a commission, um, but an advisory committee to, to this body, then I think that that would be appropriate. I don't think that I would, um, as a counselor who would benefit from or perhaps even potentially be harmed um, by the recommendation of, of such a committee. I don't think that, um, I don't think the counselors or the mayor should be on that committee. I think that I would, I would propose that um, if the citizen members of the committee are, are interested in serving in some liaison capacity, I think then um, that you all should, should make a recommendation on, on who that should be. Um, but I think that it should be made up of, of folks who are, um, who would not be influenced or potentially be impacted by by the, any recommendation that would then come to this body and then that recommendation may or may not go forward to council. I think that's probably the, the process that I would would see being pot successful potentially. Are you thinking just uh, budget committee? Or other members of oh, the Oh, no, thing for sure, talking. more members, but so I just mean in terms of not, uh, someone from this board you, in a liaison. I mean, typically, you know, we have some sort of a liaison, right. um, and, and I think that it would be appropriate for one of the citizen members to liaise if we decided that we needed a liaison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no, I think it would be um, an independent task force or committee, advisory committee. Well, I would agree with you that if there is a Blue Ribbon Committee put together that counselors and the mayor should not serve on it and maybe it's a taking applications maybe it's a thinking I'd want to make sure that there were varied viewpoints and yep. and people that could represent the entire in a sense the entire community because mm -hmm. I mean, we, we're not up here to take care of ourselves or right. to serve ourselves or to forward our own personal agenda so specifically that we don't listen to others. We're up here for 21,000 people. And I'm not saying that we should like go out to vote, you know, without knowing what we're talking about, but I think it, it behooves us to try to be as reasonable and fair in the selection of a task force. And maybe that's something that the HR director and the city manager and the chair of the and finance budget committee. committee, you know, do in tandem with each other or something. And the others of us are not involved in that. It seems like it would make sense for the city manager's office and, and finance department as well as um, yeah. Maybe HR, I think, you know, if there are questions about implications that, I mean, at, when the task force is, is weighing some of these questions, mm -hmm. um, that a lot of them, we probably haven't even thought about all of them tonight. I don't think we necessarily should, but I think the task force will come up with a lot of questions that might, you know, be that might need to be answered by HR or, or finance, or, but I think the city manager's office makes sense to me. Yeah, and also the city manager in finance would know if, in fact, it was a decision between do we fund a BC or do we fund this over here or do we fund city council? You know, the, all those things would have to would have to be weighed. But it would seem to me that if we're talking about compensation for the mayor and or mayor and councilors, that there are other pieces that come into that where HR would be important or at least some input from them as it moved along. You know, does that mean you pay PERS? Does that mean you have to provide insurance or offer insurance? Does that, you know, what happens with expenses? Um, you know, right now, if we go to a meeting, we get, we can you know claim that expense if we drive to Salem we claim that expense what happens when all those other pieces you know come together I, there's a lot of moving parts to it I guess is what I'm it's saying it's more complicated it's uh, much more complicated than just yeah. saying I mean you know I'm going to be real biased I think that this council has done a great job in the community and we're all engaged in a variety of ways 
if it hadn't been for Mark, I know there's a lot of things that wouldn't have happened and a lot of tables that wouldn't have been served, if you will, by the representation. Um, but I also have to say, I went into this knowing it was an unpaid position. I was surprised to find out we got a stipend and I'm happy they buy us three meals a month to, you know to eat while we're at meetings uh, mm -hmm. you know it works for me um, but I could be what you guys are thinking of too oh that's that old retired person you know there she is but you know uh, but I'm the only one on council the others they're not retired yet you know and Mark's not really retired yet you know no um, but it, you know, we we each choose how we're going to do this job, if you will. So that's why I thought of a job description is kind of interesting, um, because what if you, I mean, you know, how does that limit in the future? I mean, most of us aren't going to be here, you know, eight years, four years, whatever, you know, from now. We have to think about all those future dominoes. If one goes down, what happens to all all the rest? There are just a multitude <laughs> of moving parts. Um, I'm not basically in support of paying everybody, you know, a living wage or whatever, but I understand the differences that compensation makes, and at the very least, you know, we should be like tied to CPI or something. You know, um, when all those other expenses out there go up, I mean. You know, ours doesn't. That's for sure. So, and I think those are all good questions for a task force to tackle. I, so I don't too. think that that we we should be answering those questions ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So the only sorry, this is Anne. I just wanted to say the only concern that I have on anything that was said so far is uh, I need to talk to the staff before any assignments are made individually to them. Uh, I'm not sure what the what the staff capabilities are right now. But uh, Bonnie and Gary and I will get together, and we're happy to continue this dialogue. Um, I will probably return to council with some questions about what should be included in the task force simply because um, oh, as I just closed in the past, <clears throat> often what they ask is, well, what do other cities do? We've provided that tonight. Right. And that was the basic question uh, in the beginning. How do we stack up with others? Oh, we know in Oregon no. we, we aren't doing it. No. at all and there are other the states city. where cities that they, and they yeah. do so I think that 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 question could be broadened I think that the initial question for this council was was a good one and, and staff provided that answer and yep. yeah so and do it sounds like you don't really need like a motion with a vote what you need is just to understand that there's direction from the budget committee to consider or to work on, or however you want to put it, putting together a committee to research this thought? Uh, it sounds like I have a unanimous vote. Is anyone into that? All in What's favor. Aye. 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 Yeah. Aye. In, in favor of? A compensation Asking, committee, task oh, force, okay. or some such thing. Okay. Some research, be, research being done by an independent group that will flesh out later. I think an important part of that is somehow to get the public involved because we had the public here and this public is educated somewhat. They know that yeah. the mayor and council are not others, getting paid yeah. very much and they're getting a lot of benefit. What about the rest of the public? Right. They probably feel the same way. Yeah. And I think, you know, the committee or task force needs to bring them in somehow. Mm -hmm. Maybe just like a, a very small series of educational meetings um, from what I'm hearing here. It seems like that if you have transparency, which is with a group of people, not yourselves, that are going to benefit or, or are in control of the budget to make an independent recommendation. And if we educate the um, citizens in Milwaukee, I was on an email thread. I don't know if that's a private one or how I found out, but I have a busy night. I have to leave in three minutes, but I made some time to come out when I could. I see all sorts of issues that I want to come out for. Um, I came out for this because I know how hard Mayor Gamba works, and I would like to see this continue. So I think if, if you all do continue to do what you're doing and have it be independent, have it be practical, realistic, and if you communicate to the voters, then they have every opportunity to come and say, you know, we're not interested in this. And if those naysayers don't come out, then 
great. They can complain later. I mean, this is politics and stuff. We're never going to have 100% <laughs> consensus. But as a voter, I just want to, I would just want to know. You know, today I got something about the 100 year flood plan. I'm just like, okay, thanks for telling me. What can I really do about this? <laughs> if I'm in it or out of it. <laughs> but at least I got it. I do have to take off. And thank you, everybody, for. Great. service. Good to see you. Thank you. So are we going to start with the budget committee chair, <clears throat> the human resource director, and the city manager beginning discussions to about how to move forward and take a recommendation? Well, what I thought I heard from our yeah. city manager is that she would talk to staff and then she would come back to city council about question, any questions that still were there and then the task force or committee would be put together at that point. She has tacit agreement that we wanted to head in that direction. But I thought I understood her to say her next step, the next step, would well, be her, her discussion. Staff, with, yes. yes, she needs to find out if she's got yeah. bandwidth. Yeah. That's yeah. true. But I wanted to make sure that we had somebody from the citizen side, yeah. the chair, in that discussion as we go forward. Yeah. That's what I understood. So, Ann, just correct me if I'm wrong, but the budget committee can't really vote on creating a committee, but the city council members can. So, the budget can. They're the just making a recommendation tonight. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the council would do the actual um, action at a future meeting. Just clarify. Yep. So, I take this as direction to the, to the council, and we'll have the discussion. Uh, with staff when I return, um, and we can take that into the council meeting then in December. And I think we'll also need Bonnie. Thanks. need the. Uh I know that the conflict of interest rules have come up on these compensation issues because you can't vote on your own compensation. So I've seen cities where the mayor recuses him or herself and then the council votes for the mayor's compensation. But when the council is voting, it has to take effect after the election because they can't vote on their own. Oh, really? That's oh. how some cities are approached. Well, I know at Clackamas County, it, they all vote on, the whole budget committee votes on the commissioner's compensation. But is it for that current year or yeah. the following? No. Well, for it begins a month after we finish deliberations. Again, where's our attorney? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's one of the things that I think Ann will research and find yes. out. Right. You know, yep. So, right. yeah. But that's a valid point. Yeah. Let's move on to bank charges. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Guys. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everyone. Bank charges. And as the room is moving around, I just wanted to disclose I'm going to only be able to be on the phone for about 22 more minutes. <laughs> Which I didn't hear what she said. She only, be on only has 20 for 22 minutes. more minutes. Oh, 22. Okay, yeah, there's got a it. TV show coming up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have a little girl. I'm not sure how long I'll last. Yeah. Okay, moving along. Yeah. Um, okay, so bank charges. So um, back in the 2019-20 um, buy-in budget meeting hearings, um, the conversation about bank charges came up and what those bank charges are and um, there's various questions about how the city is being charged for those bank charges. So I've written up a memo with those questions outlined um, and I was going to go over them briefly tonight. Um, but the first question was what are the bank charges and what, what are we, what is the city paying for? So first we have is the credit card fees. So merchant credit card fees, they make up about 98% of all of our bank charges um, and that's for taking in utility billing payments, court, um, we have some with police, the library, um, and the building department. So those are a good portion of our bank ch charge that we bring in. Um, and it's about $94,000 um, roughly around uh, for fiscal year 18. So, so um, the, those fees include the intercharge credit card fees. Um, uh, that actually make up the 24,000. Um, those are assessed by the actual credit card company. Um, then we also have service fees, and those are by the merchant provider. Um, and that just also, again, depends on the type of credit card that people use. Um, so um, those are approximately about $5,000 for the year. 
And then last, we have monthly charges. So again, credit card fees are the majority of what we actually have to pay for in the city. It is also probably the number one payment that we receive in the city. Um, second to that is bank fees. Um, we have all of our banking services that um, requires um, the purchasing cards, the the depository accounts that we have, the lockbox, the um, the electronic transfers, um, fraud alert systems. Um, those are all through the actual bank account that we have, and those are about five thousand um, dollars a month, easily. So, and that ranges. It just depends on how much we bring in in cash and check um, on a daily basis. Uh, lastly, we also have the transaction fees through ENCODE, our software system. So anytime, um, for example, if you're paying your utility bill online, um, there is a dollar, I think it's a dollar 50 or dollar 25, depending on what it is, um, fee that the city pays for each one of those transactions. So that's on top of the credit card fees and um, that we pay with the merchant account. So those are, those are costs that we, we eat as a city. Is that in a, order to provide that service to customers. Is that a website service or a, it is? Okay. Yeah. Um, the second to that um, meeting we also had, are there certain credit cards that the city should not accept or based on the fees? Um, the majority of the credit cards that we receive are Visa and MasterCard. There are higher, higher fees associated with American Express and Discover Card. Um, but when we looked at the numbers and going backwards, we actually don't accept that many of American Express and Discover cards. The majority of those are all MasterCard and Visa. So, um, the next question was whether or not a dollar limit on the credit card should um, uh, should, the, should there be a dollar amount limit on the credit card transactions due to increase in fees. Um, when we did the analysis, we actually uh, um, looked at different types of transactions and we did have some fairly large transactions usually it's related to um, building permits um, we had some developers pay some pretty large bills with their credit card um, they range about three percent for those and so it wasn't actually it was actually quite surprising to us because we thought that we would actually see a major increase in in the fees associated with that transaction it actually wasn't that that large, and actually we would be paying that fee if we had submitted a um, a check or a, uh, cash through the deposit. So it's kind of a wash. Wait, explain that. Mm -hmm. We have to pay our bank to accept cash or or yeah. a check. Yeah. So every time, yeah, because because we it's called a depository account. So every time. Um, the security system picks up our bank deposit. It goes to the bank. They have to count it. They have to reconcile it. They, they do their transactions through it. And so there is a small fee that goes along with that. 3%. There, yeah, it's about 3%. So. Because I'm sure it costs $300 in employee time to cancel a check from one developer. Wow. Is there is there a a cap where they say three percent up to X dollars, or is it always three percent of the value? Um, it really just depends. I'm actually. talking for credit cards, actually, not the oh. other. But um, or do you know if 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 someone wrote us a check for whatever reason, fifty thousand dollars, is still three percent, or do you know if it's capped? Um, I don't know that on the top okay. of my head. Do I know? Yeah. It doesn't state that. It doesn't state that. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's an actual cap or not. It's okay. a good question, though. I can dig into that. Um, can I ask you something back on, um, or may I sure. ask you something back on uh, number two? Are there certain credit cards the city should not accept? And I mean, I've been aware for a long time that there are higher fees charged with those three I'm back like when I was running the chamber we just wouldn't take them because it was kind of ridiculous to pay that much more for them can we do that can we um, or is it so minimal by the time it all ends up that it's not worth it to us to exclude them from the mix I, yeah. um 
Right now, it's been very minimal. I mean, we haven't really had that many to... But then don't you also still have to pay a fee every month to be able to, like, take Discover cards or to take, um, you know, American Express or whatever? There is. A, it's a small fee, yeah. I think, um, I don't know how the, off the top of my head, but there is a small fee associated with each type of credit card. So whether you that monthly fee. take one or not, you're still paying yes. the company. But it's it's small. I want to say it's, it's like almost $25 a month, I would say. I mean, it's pretty small mm -hmm. to accept. It's just a regular service fee. So, yeah. yeah. I'm looking for every little bit. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then the next question that came up was, um, is there any way to recoup credit card and bank fees? Um, so we did uh, look at several cities, and actually the majority of them also, they do the similar system that we have, where they pay for all the credit card fees and the bank fees. They don't um, bring that back to the customer. Um, a lot of times when customers are having to pay for their um, their utility bill, the only way that they can make a payment is through credit cards. Um, so they, some cities do actually take bank fees into account when looking at their, their rates and charges for the year, um, mm -hmm. the utility rates. Um, we haven't, to my knowledge, we haven't actually done in that type of analysis work when we look at utility rates. Um, but the other hand of that too is that we also don't want to spend the, the staff time to go chasing after those payments and that's the biggest piece of it I mean going to collections and filing liens that's that takes quite a bit of time does it ultimately work out better for the city if more people or and would it if there were more people who used EFT to pay like their utility bills and whatever's um, mm -hmm. than those that walk in the door to pay it with your credit card? Yeah, or and we... Credit card or whatever. Yeah, we do have um, services in place where we can have customers where they directly get it out of their, their bank yeah. account every month. I mean, month. that's what I do, mm -hmm. you know, so... Yeah, and I believe that is actually <clears throat> cheaper than getting a credit card, actually getting a credit card fee. So, I mean, if, uh, you know, if there were a way for us even to encourage more citizens to utilize that service, mm -hmm. I know some people still are hesitant in paying their bills by mail, but, or by email, or electronically, or whatever, you know, but um, I think it works quite slick. <laughs> you know? But wouldn't the city pay a bank fee? There, it would be minimal, fee, though. But I think I believe it's quite a bit minimal compared to. Yeah, the it's yeah. that's what I mean. It it saves time and effort for both the payee and the payor, you know, um, and saves bank fees. On I would think mm -hmm. it saves bank fees on the city's behalf. Right? Yeah. But you don't get mileage points. <laughs> yeah, you do. You still get. I mean, you get your points. No, not if it well, came out see, of a checking account. Well, see, I pay mine account. with I pay mine with debit card, so I mean, you know, it goes takes out of my checking account, not my save, not my, my, not my credit card. Right. Right. There is actually, if we um, do accept debit cards versus credit cards, there is also a savings there. Yeah, yeah. So, something to consider. Actually, I'm wrong. My my city bill comes out of my credit card. I think. Okay. Yeah, I have a couple of them that come out. Yeah, one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah whatever so there are some options that I laid out in this memo um, whether or not we want to continue with uh, the same method we are actually going out for uh, an RFP in the coming year for banking services which was going to include merchant services as well um, so that's the first option if you want to go through that that process um, the second option is to start looking at setting thresholds for accepting credit card payments to reduce fees. But again, um, there may not be quite as much savings there. Um, we can look at building fees into the rate schedules. Um, this is the third option. And then lastly is a charge convenience fee. <coughs> but again, the fee would have to... Um, that fee has to go across the board. We can't say, oh, okay, if you're... If it's a, a fee for $5,000, or if you're paying something for $5,000, you get a fee. We have to, it's across the board, whether it's $5 versus $10,000. Can you do something 
like what the county does on property tax where it's if you pay all of it like by a certain date it's discounted or if you pay it in like by the next date then it's discounted a little less and if you don't then you pay the whole entire amount over like three payments or something i mean those are for bigger payments obviously but right i don't yeah. i don't think we have any transactions in the city that that would actually apply okay. to i mean you, most of this is utility bills. most of it's court and in courts yeah water bill or utility bills and stuff like that yeah i think we go the other way a stick if you don't pay on time have what a penalty yeah, you know, yeah. No yeah, care, no just the stick. No care, just the stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, uh, you mentioned we're going out for an RFP for a banking service. When are we doing that? Mm -hmm. um, I think we're on schedule to start that sometime in the spring. Who's our current to bank? Start the yeah. Sorry? Who is our current banking? Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. Wells Fargo. And are all the fees running through the finance department? Yes. So if we added them to the budget for the utilities mm -hmm. you would do what a transfer or a, or a charge yeah we would do a transfer Just through yeah it'd be built them. into the transfers yeah yeah see and i have mixed feelings about that because after you do enough of those mm -hmm. your head starts to spin and you're not really sure where you really ended up and if it was worthwhile at the start, it's almost better at times to just keep it here and not transfer it to that fund mm -hmm. so you can keep an eye on it and you are better able to manage it that way um well we the when we worked on the the transfers through the budget process mm -hmm. um it was built in through that transfer schedule so there was um the credit card fees um they were basically when you when we did the analysis for the credit card fees it gets looked at against what is actually being utilized by those utility mm -hmm. funds. Mm -hmm. So the transfers, it works in through it, through in the transfers. So I'm not explaining that very well, but it's already in there. It is what in you're the transfers. Saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Bonnie, how often do we go out for banking RFPs, and do we find that it's pretty competitive in mm -hmm. what the various proposers? Um, actually, we when do you know when we did? It was long before I started here when we've actually gone through an RFP process for the bank. Um, yeah. It was probably 2011, 2012, possibly. Yeah. Hmm. So, so I can't really answer that question because we haven't actually have done it um, in the last at least the last five years. All right. Yeah. Another question that I had that uh, regarding some of our options. When I think about where we are potentially losing money for these credit card transactions, I think of the big development ones. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to ding the people paying their utility bill, and I don't really don't want to encourage them using checks because of the process that that incurs, and that you don't know that you're going to that's going to clear and all of that. Right. Yeah. But rather than saying we're always going to treat it this way or always going to treat it that way, can we treat it differently depending on what they're paying for? And I throw this out to the to everyone, not just you, Bonnie, but um, I feel like the developers who are writing these big checks can handle this a little bit more than mm -hmm. mom and pop paying their sewer bill or their water bill. Mm -hmm. Well, one way to look at it, I mean, most um, the developers, they're paying large dollar amounts and we could, um, we could limit, you know, paying by credit card fees or by check. Um, I mean, there's ways around that and not penalize or have any additional um, transaction fees related to utility billing customers so for example I'd, I'd have to look into the to the laws around this but I believe you can charge like a convenience fee potentially to um, I mean I'd have to for, I'd have to really for tra transactions above a certain threshold yeah but I but again I'd have to verify that with Visa and MasterCard because they have very specific rules on what okay. you can and can't do and it might be easier to do it on a threshold all the way across <laughs> instead of picking one area. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I would think that it's the only development or some of those are the only areas where you're going to hit that threshold. At least I hope my water bill never hits the threshold. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel like mine's... Yeah. It's getting there. It, but it hit my <laughs> threshold. It will when your water main breaks in yeah. your house. <laughs> well, I hope that doesn't happen too. Anyway, it was just a thought. Not something to think about. 
So what I'm hoping is some direction on whether you not you want to go through any of these alternatives. Do you want to look at the RFP process for the banking services or? RFPs are always good. I mean, banking mm -hmm. banks are always mm -hmm. finding out ways to charge more. Yeah. So I'm sure when you go out there, you're going to find some competitive offers. Mm -hmm. I like Shane's idea of, of uh, some kind of convenience fee for over 5000 or 10000 I don't know what the size of the checks are coming in from the developers, but mm -hmm. they can afford it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. <laughs> good. You got enough direction to... Yeah, I'm good. Get something yeah. going? Okay. Good. Right. Cool. <laughs> Supplemental budget. Good job. Okay, <clears throat> so there are several <clears throat> changes that um, we are looking at you for the supplemental budget. Um, just to back up that <clears throat> the um, on June 5th, we had the budget committee meeting for the biennium budget that um, approved the, the total budget for the next two years. Um, but since then, there's things that arise that, that come to our attention that um, need to be reviewed or changed. Um, per the um, local Oregon local budget law, <clears throat> we can come back to you with a supplemental budget um, and for city council's um, adoption um, in two forms. It's uh, if it's 10% or more, then we need to come back and have a public hearing. There's one piece in the supplemental budget that would require a public hearing, um, which is currently set for December 18th, I believe. Um, Correct. And, and um, so, so I'm going to go over each one of these. Um, the biggest one is the last one. <clears throat> the first one is increasing the parking enforcement for downtown Milwaukee. Um, on November 13th, uh, City Council discussed the evaluation of the parking enforcement program. Um, we also did a parking analysis study <clears throat> that um, recommended that we increase the half-time position to a full-time position. Uh, and with that increase, the um, the the offset would be the actual increase in the citations, the revenue generated for um, him going out there and um, posting tickets to for parking permits. Um, so we're looking at about a fifty-seven thousand dollar increase for the the biennium, and that's inclusive of all the budget. Um, excuse me, that's all inclusive of the benefits. And Layla is actually still here. Yeah, Layla is here. She um, helped with the uh, parking enforcement program. So if you have any specific questions for that, she's happy to. Does this mean we're getting meters? <clears throat> no, it's actually it, the purpose of the um, increasing the parking enforcement is to um, have full-time enforcement throughout the city. So it's one person. He's going out there. Um, James Don. He's wonderful at what he does, and he's going out there and looking for people that are violating our parking rules. <clears throat> it does not increase ours. It does not include um, meters. So the parking rules are primarily the two hours? <clears throat> staying two hours or four mm -hmm. hours or yeah. in excess of one you're supposed to. Parking in a handicap zone. Right, okay. <clears throat> well, and I believe one of the neighborhoods is also starting <laughs> its parking management program, and so that's going to need someone. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Yes, uh, one of the neighborhoods has initiated um, a residential parking permit program, but for those of you who haven't sat through um, some of the uh, outreach that we did um, in adoption of the parking uh, management plan, one of the number one, um, the number one recommendation out of that was as a first step was to increase enforcement. So this is taking a first actionable step in implementing the parking uh, management strategy. Is the 57,000, you said it's the biennium? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's for, okay. Yes. Okay. So the next one is actually regarding the finance department and the police department. Uh, during the budget process, um, municipal court actually lost a half time employee. And we had supplemented that with increasing finance department with a half-time employee, moving the half-time employee from police over to finance um, with the thoughts that we would have emergency operations center focused in finance department. Um, we have 
switched alignment of that. We actually are moving that back over to the police department. So we are now just basically swapping that back over. So municipal court is going to remain to have their two and a half employee FTE. Finance department is going to lose a half time employee. We actually have a position um, uh, open right now for um, the administrative position downstairs for a half time employee that used to be a full time position. We had an employee that left on his own for um, family reasons, and so we are now filling that position with a half-time instead of the full-time. The, uh, the third item is increasing revenues related to personal costs in the building inspection fund. So we are um, increasing the permit technician position from a half-time employee to a full-time position. However, this isn't um, increasing the full employee count actually we are decreasing uh, community development had a half time position we are moving that position over to permit sorry to building department in order to make them whole with a full-time position and that's mainly because um, the increase of volume that they've had in the building department what's coming out of community development <laughs> it's a half-time um, position I mean it's a half-time administrative position so does that mean community development doesn't have any administrative no. help or they have a half so time? Happens, sorry. Go ahead. So they actually have two FTE that are admins at the JCP building. Uh, they actually technically right now have three. What the position is that was given up was a portion, uh, there was a part-time building I'm sorry, a part-time engineering tech that was also going to be hired at the same time, um, and it was going to be done in partnership with the building official position. Um, they decided to forgo that position until we have our engineering director back on board, because uh, they still have a couple of positions that they could fill out their team with. And they've decided instead what they really need is to take a full-time admin with them from the JC building. So what will happen is that two FTE will stay at JCB with the community development team, and then one admin would leave that building and come over to the city hall building with the new engineering team, and Sam would end up with a full building official. It's a little convoluted, but the short answer is it keeps the FTE count. Everybody keeps an at least one admin, but in, JC, in the community development's case, two admin. Uh, and we just shift some FTE around to make sure that we're putting our, our bodies where we need people the most right now. Got it. Thank you. And is the cost increase just because of the higher salary then, if it's not changing the FTE count? Well, that's moving. Um, that's actually moving. Well, it, it's increasing the, um, the cost in the building fund. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's increasing the cost in the building fund, but then but there's an offset the of decrease revenues. in yeah. community development, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. Well, the the revenue is actually generated from the building. All the build, building activity is sustaining that increase for the half time employee, the additional half time employee being moved from community development to building to building. So I, I guess I'm sorry I don't follow why. Why does the total budget adjustment increase by 55,000 then? So because the community development is it's in the general fund. So in the building department we ha it's its own set alone special revenue fund. So we have to increase the the costs in the building department to offset the um, it's the revenues have have increased. So actually mm -hmm. and you'll see it in the um, the quarterly report. So we actually have enough revenues to cover the cost of that one additional half-time employee. Admin. Okay. So in total, the FTE count for the city does not change. Correct. However, in the building department, there's an increase in cost, and the offset is the increase that we have received already in revenue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, we have the general fund transferred to the library fund, and this is. Um, related to the library project, um, we are transferring from the general fund contingency of three hundred eleven thousand dollars to the library fund. 
um, and Layla can, she's the project manager on the library um, redevelopment, so I don't know if you want to speak anything to the in general. Uh, sure. While Layla's coming up, actually just real fast before Layla goes, <laughs> this was a discussion during the budget meeting. I don't know if you remember, but at the second meeting in May, we talked about the fact that, or actually I think it was at the third, we talked about the fact that there was some contingency that was unexpected, uh, unexpended or uncalculated towards expense. Uh, and we did not know where we were going to be coming in, so we told, we asked if we could place it in contingency for the library uh, with the guests that we'd be back to move it into the actual revenue, or into the actual expenditure line. And now I'll transfer the conversation over to Layla. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that we're um, expecting to get our cost estimate from the, our contractor next week, and so we'll establish a GMP, um, which is our guaranteed maximum price. So that is the price that will be set for the construction of the library. So what this does is it gives us a little bit of breathing room. Um, we're anticipating and hoping those costs will come in as we expect them to, um, but in this construction market and with the delays that we've had so far with the library, we felt that it was prudent to have those resources available at hand should any unexpected um, costs arise or escalation impact um, what we're anticipating for the guaranteed maximum price. So it's just, just earmarking the funds? Yes, oh, and transferring them into the fund. So that it doesn't get used elsewhere? Correct. Okay. And it, it very well could be used, but we will be um, you know, exerting every effort that we can to stay within the GMP that we agreed to. So we have separate funds. We have a library fund and we have a general fund and we're taking general fund contingency money and putting it in the library fund. Yeah. And we and we can do that. Mm -hmm. Do a supplemental. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. <clears throat> Is that the one that requires the hearing because of the 10%? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> it will require a public hearing. And then it goes back if they don't use it. <laughs> right. And if it doesn't get used, it'll go back to the general fund. Yeah. So then that goes to the council? And so yeah, so then we'll take this to city council on December 18th. Right. So we'd be looking for recommendations from the budget committee. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> so do we need to vote to recommend that it be adopted by city council or is it just tacit agreement? Uh, technically you don't have to vote, but if you wish you can. Yeah. As long as we all know and understand that it means, yeah, we want it to go to city council. All, all, okay. all in favor of the yeah, thumbs thumbs up, kind of budget thing. as presented? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Aye. All right. Got it. <laughs> okay. Bonnie, I'm dropping off the call. Okay, thank Thanks you, Ann. Everyone. Yeah, Ann. Bye. <clears throat> okay. Um, last on the agenda is the quarterly report. Um, the, uh, on the quarterly report, um, you'll see quite a bit of a difference this time around. Um, we did quite a bit of changes. Um, one of those is actually um, creating this quarterly highlight section um, that kind of just outlines a couple of things that I think that council has asked or the budget community members have asked over the, the course of in the last year or whatnot. Um, should we try to highlight those here? Um, I like to kind of skip over the, the, um, the executive summary a little bit. It's pretty much the same of what you've seen before in the past. The only thing different is that city attorney section has been removed because we now have a city attorney in-house. So we don't have any, any uh, invoices or bills to actually outline them. So again, this is for the first quarter, so it's as of September 30th. Um, 2018 for the fiscal year ending 2019. Um, if you go to page five, you see this new section called All City Funds. Um, this wasn't in here previously, but you'll see that total citywide we've had a $38 million um, total beginning fund balance. And since also, I actually just want to make sure to reiterate that this is unaudited. We're actually going through the audit right now. 
um, and that is anticipated to wrap up in the middle of December. So these beginning fund balance cessation change at this point, um, but I just want to make sure that you all know that we're going through the audit. Anywho, so $38 million in beginning fund balance. Um, total revenues um, in this last quarter were at $30 million. However, expenditures were at $8 million. $8.8 million. That left, with, uh, left us with a ending fund balance of $59 million, and a lot of that is attributed to that transportation bond that we received in July. So if you go to the next page on the general fund, um, the, the addition to the flexible budget has been added per the conversation that we had at the last quarterly meeting. Um, <clears throat> so I was going to go over some of the key notes that, um, that we found during this process for the quarterly. The flexible budget for the uh, property tax, you'll see it was at 204000 and we actually received 248000 There was quite a bit, big uh, Comcast back payment of property taxes that we received, received this last quarter. Um, and so that is actually within that $200,000 range. So I don't know much about the case exactly, but I do know that Comcast had several years of back payment of property tax. And so we finally got that along with all the other cities in the um, Clackamas County. Is it property tax or right of way? It is related to property tax. Huh. Mm -hmm. Is that that central, uh, is that court case where the central, the way they were calculating, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where, but central something is the name of it, but yeah. central assessment or something like that. Right. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Looking at um, fines and forfeitures, so receipts are earned on a reimbursement basis. There's a timing difference, actually. Oh, sorry, that was intergovernmental, not fines and forfeitures. Number three is fines and forfeitures, and you'll see that there's been actually an increase in parking and abatement fines where, in this last quarter. Where in the budget would it show during the, during the hearing or the conversation we were having on right-of-way, um, changing <clears throat> the rules, uh, we learned that um, some of the people using our right-of-way were way behind on like three years behind on their payments. Um, does it, is there somewhere in the budget that that's reflected, that there's a deficit or a, a debt? Um, like money owed, money outstanding? We have a receivable. A receivable. <laughs> well, right, but it's, how is that reflected in, in here? Because it, up until the, that uh, m meeting we had to yeah. deal with that code, I was unaware that that there were certain... Mm -hmm. um, it would be considered <coughs> And we actually wouldn't see that in these because these are all on the income step in. That's on the balance sheet side. But um, once we do actually get that money in, you'll see it here under uh, general fund, probably under miscellaneous revenue. When we actually do get the money back in. From but it is reflected somewhere in this document? If we get the money in, so no, before we do, before not in here, because so that, there that is, wouldn't be in this. Okay, so there is, there is no place that we would ever have a heads up that we have major right of way users that aren't paying their bills. Um, not currently in this report, the way. But it would be in the balance sheet, right? It'd be in the balance sheet, yes. And we just don't see the balance sheet. No, you don't see the balance sheet here in this report. This is just how much work is it to see the balance sheet? Um, well, don't take us there, my love. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, he's asking how to see it. Well, no, I, I, I That's and how it's, you see it. it's a yeah. serious question. I, I mean, it, it's a lot of work. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. but I don't what know. What I could do is I can pull that Just information to together and bring that <laughs> next time. I think that that's probably the one of the bigger ones that that um, with the receivable. So I could put that in and put that as part of the executive summary to to outline that. That would be what good. That would be. Right. Yeah, it, that would be good in, in this particular instance, but, but kind of more where I was going was that it was a little disconcerting to learn oh. the way we learned that we, that we had people using it right away that were that far behind mm -hmm. in their payments. 
And if there's no place that it's reflected in the budget, and there's no sort of reporting system to council that says, oh, by the way, mm -hmm. such and so subcontractor or such and so whatever hasn't paid us in. Well, we do create the, the CAFR, which is the comprehensive annual financial report. And in within there, we do talk about receivables. And the balance sheet is included. Um, there's a lot more in depth in that. For enthusiasts report. only, you can get in there and. Mm -hmm. You might see something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, excuse me. So that is available, but but I'm happy to bring that piece back to you in the next quarter. Uh, sure. Yeah, if you know of large receivables that we're going to get some mm -hmm. money on, you can or, certainly or, put or it Or that we should, or that we need to be. Right. Right. some pressure on you get some money back. some pressure on yeah. Right, right. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> um, moving along. So... Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was interest. Interest is definitely higher than anticipated. Um, the distribution yield percentage um, went up from 2.16% to 2.25% for LGIP. So we do see that increase in our interest income. Two and a quarter, huh? Two and a quarter. But like two years ago, it was like 0.5 or something. Yeah, it was pretty <laughs> minimal, yeah. So we have some kind of increase. <clears throat> um, next in the expenditures, the city attorney line um, is new. Um, <clears throat> so we have a small savings in personnel services there. Um, but other than that, uh, that department's right on track. <clears throat> uh, engineering services, um, which is the um, number eight note, uh, there are some openings. So there's some personal services savings there because we haven't been able to fill all those positions just quite yet. Uh, facilities management, um, there's some projects that aren't completed with uh, within facilities yet. Obviously this, whoops, this council chamber is being moved downstairs that hasn't been completed yet, but that's within the budget. So, um, IT, we had, um, some uh, maintenance fees that typically hit during the first portion of the fiscal year. And that's the same with the non-departmental. That's all the liability insurance premiums that we pay in the first qu quarter of the year. So moving on to the next page, I just wanted to point out, um, so we did include the actuals for the past three years to current. Um, this is brand new for this report. I did not go through and do an analysis on, you know, why one year is different than the other, but this is just uh, um, some historical reference for you all. This is a great page. I love it. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that. It's a finance nerdy thing. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. So, debt service, there's really not much um, activity that happens on the um, the first quarter of the year. Uh, the building fund shown on page 10, um, <clears throat> you'll see that there's been uh, definitely the increase in the fees and charges that I mentioned earlier. Um, we also have um, uh, some increases in the materials and services. Uh, that's related to contract work that we've had because of all the extra um, volume that we've had in the building department. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the library fund, um, we have uh, investment earnings of uh, 52000 um, which is quite a bit of uh, more than originally budgeted for, and that's related to the interest <clears throat> that received on the bond proceeds. Uh, library construction is set to begin, um, and so that's the cost have not quite hit yet. You'll probably see that quite a bit more in the next quarter. Uh, moving on to the transportation fund, uh, the biggest uh, piece to note here really is that $21 million bond, actually $20 million bond, 20.64, 20, 20. I mean there's a calculation, so, but overall the $21 million bond came in in July, and so you'll see that reflected here in this report. The projects haven't quite started yet related to that, um, but the majority of the increase in this entire fund is related to the transportation the increase in the gas tax um, mm -hmm. 
was that a result of uh, 2017, or was that an uptick in people buying gas in Milwaukee or some new gas station opening or something? Was that our local gas tax, or was that the state gas tax going up because of the... the I believe it's, it's a combination of ours and the state. Hold on. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, going back, that is something I wanted to point out in the executive summary, that um, the state gas tax, it did include $82,616 from the new gas tax revenue during the quarter. From the <clears throat> okay, so that's starting to kick in. Okay. But to the mayor's question, are you saying that, or was your question that that in also shows an increase in fuel usage? Is that what you asked, Mark? That it was. I, I was at, yeah. I was asking to, to have the number parsed a little bit. To yeah. Wh whether it was all from the state, whether there was an increase in in the purchasing of yeah, fuel yeah. in Milwaukee, or it kind of surprised me. Maybe a little bit, but I guess mm -hmm. it could be. Um, I don't have that breakdown. Um, We'd have to request that from the state. We don't actually get that breakdown, but I, I'm not sure if that's in, like increase of people getting more gas mm -hmm. necessarily. I'm not so sure, but um, because now that we have the new state piece in there, it's kind of hard to break hard it down. to compare them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The uh, bond that we issued, <clears throat> transportation bond. What what interest rate was that at? Roughly? Um. That is a good question. I'd have to I'd have to follow up on that. Okay. I can bring that back to you. Thanks. That's in the notes to the balance sheet. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. I don't remember. Okay. Moving on to the water fund. Um, <clears throat> these and charges are seasonal. Um, there's really not much to really describe here in the first quarter of the water fund. Um, Capital outlay is low. We haven't started our projects yet there. That, that usually happens more in the, the drier season. So um, we'll probably see that coming up in the next couple quarters. Um, wastewater fund. Um, we have our um, re reimbursement districts that are um, continuing to still pay. Um, those are slated to actually start dropping off, I think, in the next two years. Yes. Yeah, so um, so those are pretty stable. Um, projects haven't quite started yet. Um, and then uh, the payments for debt in the wastewater fund happen twice a year. So um, uh, we've hit one payment so far in September. The interest, so do you just um, clarify, the transportation bond was at 5% for the interest rate. 5%? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, rates have really gone That's up. That's not what I remember from the presentation. 18 months. I, I don't remember it being that high. No. Where did you get that number? Um, we will come back and clarify that. Yeah. Um, Seems like it'd be more like three and a half. I thought it was something. three something. Right. That was yeah, the number we, that was. We have a really good credit yeah. rating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We'll we'll come back and we'll okay. clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, stormwater fund. There's not much actually to stay in the stormwater capital projects. Haven't quite started there. Um, and then uh, same <clears throat> goes with the system development charges. So really, the first quarter is pretty pretty light. <laughs> There's not much many changes that actually have occurred in these last couple of months in the last quarter. Which of these funds does the CUAB work with? Um, water, wastewater, and storm water, and and SDCs. And SDCs. they also worked with SSMP and Safe. Yeah, they, yeah, they the figured out the Safe yeah. fee too. Um, lastly, you'll find there's two additional funds, um, the affordable housing fund on page 18. Um, we actually did receive quite a bit of development incentives um, in this last quarter, um, and there's been no expenses yet to date. And then the Milwaukee Redevelopment Commission received, um, it's very small, $700 in property tax, and then there's some investment earnings with that. So. 
which is the Urban Renewal Fund. Right. Was that just general increase of property values in the base, or was there were some development that didn't get it's probably uh, more of a short circuited by a difference at this vertical point. housing tax credit? Yeah. Are you talking about the affordable housing or the? No, I'm talking renewal? about the Re redevelopment commission. Yeah. Um, it might be just a, ta a timing difference. Um, for the property taxes. So. I can get more information. I have to check with Alma and <coughs> the development on that. Okay. And then lastly is the project status report. It's very similar to what you've seen in the past. Um, I wasn't going to go into a whole lot of depth on that. Is the engagement space, is that the remodel of the mm -hmm. fire station bay? Yeah. Yep. I had a question on the FTE. You, you may not be able to answer it, but uh, engineering is still really light. Do you know, are they making any progress? Or? Um, I, I don't know as far as the engineers go, associates versus civil, whether currently um, at in their yeah. recruitment process. Uh, page three. Right. Do we have there, a new um, No, I believe they're still doing interviews at the moment. Yeah. Well, that's just for the uh, engineering director. So this is because this is first quarter. We've we're at. I think we've hired the whole staff, other than that Chuck. Okay. Left. So I could just send in an email. Chuck, but I. Um, but that's also fairly recent. A couple of those are pretty recent hires, so they okay. might not be reflected yet. Right. Yeah, this is only as of September 30th. Right, right. So okay. um, right. I believe there, I thought there was still an opening, but maybe they finally filled it. So. Maybe. Yeah. I was thinking that we were up to, other than the director. Yeah. Okay. Well, I really like the changes you made in the report. Yes. I definitely yeah. like the, the, yeah. the actuals from year to year by quarters. Thank you. Okay. I, I hope it's a much easier read, and um, hopefully it clarifies um, a little bit better for yeah, you all. Yeah, definitely. So, okay. Yeah, they look good and appreciate Thank it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Is this our first budget meeting with you it as is. the finance director? So Officially, congratulations. Yes. <laughs> good work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, speaking of uh, budget committee members, did we, didn't we appoint... Yeah, we did, and I was going to ask about that, too. We appointed our new person. Mary, oh, did she yeah. not get notified that we had a... Uh, sorry, I meant to mention this early on. She did. Um, she was not able to attend this evening. Oh. She had a prior commitment. Um, but we did finally appoint Mary Rowe. Um, so we did interviews. She did an excellent job, and um, she will be here at the next budget committee meeting. She was on all the emails that you saw today, as well as all the budget materials as well. And I know she'll be watching tonight, so I apologize. I meant to say say something in the beginning, but yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations to her as well. Yeah, good. Who's going to move? We adjourn. I'll move. Second. Second. All favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Meetings over. Thank you. Thank you. Discussions.